This is American History TV's Lectures in History podcast. Lectures in History joins students in the classroom to hear lectures on campuses across the country on topics ranging from the American Revolution to 9-11. This week, University of Maryland professor Christopher Bonner teaches a class about the concept of power in antebellum slave societies. So I want to go ahead and get into it. Uh, Good morning, folks. Welcome back. It's good to see you all here today. Um, What we're going to do is uh, think through some big questions about uh, power dynamics in American slave societies today. So uh, part of this is like a building on what we talked about last Thursday. Last Thursday, we talked about Gabriel's conspiracy, um, Richmond 1800, and we talked uh, in particular about the ways Gabriel's story reflects the complexity of slavery. Slavery was a relationship between individuals, a person owned another person, and so as an experience, slavery was endlessly complex. Uh, With Gabriel, we saw some of the ways that an enslaved person could enjoy some kinds of freedom within their bondage. So different practices of power influenced the ways different people experienced slavery. And today, what we're going to do is talk through some of those practices of power. And our big questions for today are broadly about this, right? So we'll come back to these questions at the end of class, um, questions about the ways that labor influenced the lives of enslaved people in the South and the particular tools that were available to both enslaved people and slave owners in struggles over power. In the early 19th century, slave owners used their power to move massive numbers of enslaved people into cotton-producing territories. Through physical force, slave owners compelled enslaved people to work, uh, and they made massive amounts of money based on the violent extraction of labor. And slave people worked, and they lived together, and they cultivated their own kinds of power through their relationships with one another. So slaves did a number of things that enabled them to exercise a degree of control in their own lives. And so we're going to talk about both of these sides of this story here, right? The tools, the techniques of slave owner power. And we'll also talk about the tools and techniques of power uh, that were practiced by enslaved people. Before we get into the particular questions about power that we're thinking about today, I want to talk about... um, a clip from the movie 12 Years a Slave. So uh, I like this film, and I like it as uh, a teaching tool as well. Um, One of the things that I really like about it is that it... Yeah, that might make it a little better. It makes it possible to really kind of sit down and see the landscape, see the environment uh, of uh, the slaveholding South. So the story... uh, How many of you guys have seen the movie 12 Years a Slave or parts of it? Yeah. So the story is about, uh, the story is the story of this guy, Solomon Northup, who was free in the northern states and was tricked and kidnapped into slavery and spent, as the title says, 12 years in bondage. Uh, And the film is uh, based on Northup's narrative. The scene that I'm going to show is about two minutes and it's, uh, it takes place during a funeral. So the scene is just after Solomon and other people have watched a fellow enslaved man collapse and die while working in the fields. And so I want to show this, and then I want to think a little bit together about what we see here, right? Uh, Watch this and think about how we might use it to understand Solomon and how we might use it to understand human experiences of slavery, and then we'll build from there. Went down to the River Jordan Where John baptized three when I walk the devil in hell, says Johnny baptize me. I say roll, and roll. Oh, now roll, Jud and roll. My soul arise, heaven, Lord, for the year Jud and roll. Well, some say John was a Baptist. Some say John was a Jew. But I say John was a preacher because my Bible says so too. I say Roger and Roll. Roger and Roll. My soul arise in heaven, Lord, for the year when Jordan and Roll. Hallelujah. Roger and Roll. Roger and Roll. My soul arise in heaven, Lord, for the year when Jordan rose. Hallelujah. Roll, Jordan, roll. Roll, Jordan, roll. My soul arise in heaven, Lord, for the year when Jordan rose. Everybody say, roll, Jordan, roll. Roll. 
will draw the road. My soul will rise in heaven, Lord, for the year when Jordan road. Roll, Jordan road. Roll, Jordan road. My soul will rise in heaven, Lord, for the year when Jordan road. Roll, Jordan road. Roll, Jordan road. My soul will rise in heaven, Lord, for the year when Jordan road. All right, so if we look at this, if we think about what we're seeing here, right, what might this clip suggest to us about the experience of slavery? How might we be able to use this to understand what slavery was like for people who were held in bondage? What do we think? John, yeah. Uh, you mentioned like earlier about how when someone passes away, uh, like, they, they're kind of expected to, like, move on and stuff, so you can mm -hmm. see here, like, he, you could tell he was obviously, like, really upset, but then everyone is more of, like, a celebration, their funeral, and you have to move on from it, so you kind of saw him starting to sing with them at the end, realizing that he has to maybe move on and have to, has to get over what just happened. So you can get a sense of maybe, like, a collective emotional experience, but you're also suggesting there's uh, evidence of an individual emotional experience, right, that Solomon is feeling particular things. So what is, what is happening about, what is happening with Solomon Northup? What might this clip be saying about him? Uh, John, you're suggesting that he's being transformed. What's happening with him in this clip? Yeah, Laura. It looks almost like he's starting to accept his fate of the situation because he was obviously a freed man and now he's not anymore. So it kind of just, it's showing his transition from, you know, maybe this is just what my life is going to be going forward. Hmm. So uh, we could think about this, like the reality is we know Solomon Northup was enslaved for 12 years and then liberated, right? In this moment, he doesn't know that, right? So maybe part of what you're seeing is his um, grappling with that, right? The feeling of the, the possibility that slavery might be a permanent status for him, right? Other thoughts on how we might understand or think about this kind of transformation, right? Uh, what's happening with Solomon Northup in this moment? Is he just resigning himself to the fact that he's going to be a slave for life? Uh, how else might we think about it? Would you say that he feels sad? Yeah, Mary Kate. I just feel like he's having a hard time accepting the fact that everyone seems this as being normal. Because, mm -hmm. like, in the background, everyone else doesn't seem like they have animation in their faces, mm -hmm. but he seems like he's going through all these emotions. Mm -hmm. So it seems like he's trying to not accept it. Like, he doesn't want this to be his life. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a change in his face, right? But there's also a struggle, I think you can see, right? That, that what's happening here, whatever uh, Solomon might be feeling at the end of this clip, it's a feeling that he comes to gradually and as a part of a difficult process, right? It's not easy for him to feel um, what it is that he's feeling in this moment, right? So uh, I think that there are some important things that you guys have pointed to here that I want to build on a little bit, right? On a fundamental level, one of the things that we see here is that slavery could be a transformative experience. Enslavement could shape a person's life. So forced labor... Uh, and uh, connections with other, kind, with other people, right, with other enslaved people, these things could shape the ways people like Solomon Northup lived, how they thought about themselves, how they felt on a day-to-day -day basis, right? And so one of the things that I think is interesting about this scene is uh, that he does seem to almost be thinking of himself gradually as a part of this community of enslaved people. And so one way we can read that is what Laura is saying, right? Like, uh, there is a way that Solomon Northup seems to be identifying himself as a slave. In this moment, he knows that that is his status, right? But there are other ways we can think about what that might mean, right? Northup is at a funeral at, John, you were suggesting that funerals were sort of like celebrations of life, right? Northup is in this moment joining in a community that is celebrating this guy, right? Joining in a community that is singing um, a song that doesn't sound particularly sad, right? So I think that there are ways to see that Solomon Northup is changing how he sees himself uh, both in relation to the institution of slavery and in relation to other enslaved people. So the song they're singing, Roll Jordan Roll, um, it's a hymn that has its origins in communities of enslaved African Americans. Uh, and it's talking about the river that the Israelites uh, crossed just before they entered the promised land. 
And so the Jordan River is like the last task. Crossing the river is the last struggle that people would have to endure before they achieved a kind of spiritual liberation. So that's kind of a, a way of thinking about what the participation in this singing might mean to Solomon Northup, right? It's not a participation in uh, just an act of grieving, but in a particular act of grieving, an act of grieving that is designed to represent death as a triumph over uh, the bondage of uh, slavery in the South. So Solomon Northup's story, uh, as it's told in his narrative, as it's told in that film in some important ways, uh, Northup's story represents the ways a person's life could be changed by enslavement. The work of cultivating cotton had profound effects on the daily lives of Northup and of the people who were there at that funeral and of other enslaved people who were forced to cultivate cotton. Cotton grew really well in the long and hot summers of the Deep South. The fact that the summers were long and hot, though, also uh, was part of what made slavery so difficult, slave labor so difficult in these places, right? Slaves would plant cotton seeds in the spring, and then they would spend summers hoeing, and they would uh, work to keep down the weeds and the grasses uh, that popped up between the rows of plants. In late August and into the fall, they would pick the cotton. So I want to reemphasize how important the cotton gin was for transforming the economy of the United States. The gin separated the seeds out of cotton fibers. And before this machine existed, enslaved people were forced to do this by hand. So this was a slow process, and essentially it's described as like a production bottleneck. It limited the amount of cotton that could be cultivated in any one year. Eli Whitney's cotton gin made it possible for enslaved people to clean more cotton. And so slave owners, of course, because they wanted to maximize their profits, they wanted to force enslaved people to produce more cotton for the market. So after the invention of the cotton gin, more enslaved people were forced to produce more cotton to satisfy slave owners' demands. And part of what we can see then is that technology is one of the tools that slave owners use to exert power over enslaved people. Picking cotton was a particularly difficult process because cotton is a stubborn crop. And so what you're looking at here is a a bowl, a cotton bowl. When it's ripe, the bowl blooms, uh, it opens up, and raw white cotton fibers are exposed. But the bowls, and you can kind of see it here, the bowl doesn't always open all the way. And so the job of a person who's picking this crop is to reach in and try to pull out as much of the fiber as they can to avoid pulling out stems uh, and other kinds of aspect, pieces of the plant or the leaves, but also to avoid cutting themselves. The leaves of the cotton bowl are sharp. And so this is like a, a profoundly difficult task. Uh, it requires a lot of dexterity uh, and really leads to a lot of small injuries on the hands, on the fingers of people who are forced to pick cotton. So the cotton gin encouraged more slave owners to acquire more enslaved people and to compel them to do this difficult work. In order for this to happen, slave owners relied on constant supervision, and they relied on regular violence to compel uh, enslaved labor. So we're going to look at a couple of pieces of Northup's narrative as we work through today, um, and I'm going to highlight some things that he shows us, some things that he reveals about the ways uh, the work of the plantation took place. So in his narrative, Northup described some of the order, some of the structures uh, of power on a cotton plantation. The landscape, one of the things he points out here, the landscape was, arra- uh, was arranged into rows. So there were uh, neat, orderly ways of uh, laying out a cotton field. That made it easy for uh, overseers or slave drivers or slave owners. It made it easy for them to see the progress of enslaved people as they were moving across a field. If everybody's lined up, you can see how far everyone is moving. So the positioning of the overseer is one of the things that Northup highlights here, right? The positioning is really important. An overseer is up on horseback. And you can imagine, like, somebody who is standing 10 feet tall and how much they could see Uh, as opposed to somebody who's five and a half or six feet tall, right? Uh, So overseers on horseback would literally 
see over, watch over uh, the work of enslaved people. And overseers would use the whip uh, to continue to compel enslaved people to do this work, right? Northup writes that the lash is, is constantly moving. All day long, people are being whipped. The sound of the lash is like a constant uh, background noise for plantation labor. So the labor of cotton shaped enslaved people's lives, and at the same time, the crop, cotton reshaped the United States. So cotton changed the nation's geography, and it also changed, it also changed the nation's economy. We looked at this slide uh, in other contexts, and I pointed out the, the early statehood of uh, Louisiana, 1812, Mississippi, and Alabama, right? Uh, this movement of people into uh, what's now the Deep South, right? What was then called the Old Southwest. So we can see here, like, the movement of the nation uh, into these spaces, when we look at these maps, we can think about other aspects of what's actually happening when these states are being created. So these maps connect the movement of people to uh, the movement or the expansion of cotton production. So you can see two big things here. The top map is 1820, the bottom map is 1840, and each of the dots represents, I think it says 2,000 bales of cotton. So two basic things, right? One, in 1840, there are a lot more dots than there were in 1820. There's a lot more cotton being produced as the 19th century was progressing. And the other thing you can see is the, the shift in where that production was happening. Uh, it was being concentrated around the Mississippi River. Uh, the production of cotton was moving into new spaces, south and west, uh, as the 19th century progressed. So the people... And the work of cotton moved south uh, and west as the 19th century progressed. So the map is representing cotton bales, where these things were being produced, right? But uh, implicit in this map, right, are the people who are forced to do the labor of producing cotton. So each of these dots represents some dozens or hundreds or thousands of enslaved people moved into the south and into the west to produce this cotton. So the map is a representation not only of the movement of people across the country, uh, the movement of cotton production, but also the movement of enslavement, right? The, the transformation of the geography of slavery. I mentioned uh, a few weeks back when we were talking about the late colonial period, I mentioned that the slave population in North America uh, by the late 1700s, was experiencing a natural increase. The population was going up even beyond the numbers of enslaved people who were being imported. In 1808, the U.S. banned the import of enslaved Africans through the Atlantic slave trade. So legally, there were not uh, new enslaved people being brought into the country. But even after that, the population continued to grow. In 1810, there were about 1.1 million slaves in the U.S., in 1830, there were about 2 million slaves in the U.S. And in 1840, there were about 2.5 million. So in the early 1800s, massive numbers of these people were moved south and west uh, in what historians have come to describe as the Second Middle Passage. And this is, of course, a reference to the, you know, the, the main middle passage, the first middle passage, which we've talked about, the transfer of people across the Atlantic Ocean uh, in the bottoms of slave ships, right? Twelve million people uh, extracted from uh, Africa and transported to the Americas. The second middle passage describes this movement, massive movement of enslaved people into cotton-producing territory. So between 1800 and 1860 an estimated one million people were moved into these territories. And so this is a, a contemporary image that's kind of representing, uh, or it's a, a representation of uh, what was called a coffle. Uh, and this isn't a, a critical term for us. Um, I don't know if you'll be able to read that, actually. So, coffle is basically the term that was used for a group of enslaved people chained together, uh, forced to walk over long distances, right? And this is uh, a coffle that was being moved from uh, Virginia to Tennessee. And so from the uh, old uh, tobacco-producing regions of the country, chiefly uh, into newer spaces that were being intended for cultivating cotton. 
An enslaved man named Charles Ball described what it was like to be part of a coffle uh, as he was moving from Maryland to South Carolina. So I think this, this image is, is, a, is useful as a contemporary representation, but this image actually, I think, gives us some more texture to see what it would have actually been like, right? Ball wrote this about being in a coffle. The women were tied together with a rope about the size of a bed cord, which was tied like a halter around the neck of each. But for the men, a strong iron collar was closely fitted by means of a padlock round each of our necks. A chain of iron about 100 feet long was passed through the hasp of each padlock. In addition to this, we were handcuffed in pairs. And so you can get a little bit of a better sense of uh, the forced connection of people uh, in this image. You can see that these two guys in the front are chained together at the wrist uh, and that this guy on the front right is chained uh, by the ankle to people behind him. And so this is, on an obvious level, like awful, right? People being bound together and forced to walk long distances uh, to a new life and a different kind of enslavement. But there are little things that I think people might not think about when you consider how difficult the situation would be. Uh, so people are forced to walk all day, uh, and then at night they're forced to try to sleep. But often there wasn't enough slack in the rope or the chains to allow them to actually lie down. Um, people were bound together in pairs, and when one person needed to go to the bathroom, uh, they often had to stay bound to the person to whom they were chained, right? Uh, and so the, the concept of privacy is kind of eradicated in some ways by um, the bonds of a coffle. So the second middle passage moves people in substantial numbers from uh, the states of the Upper South and of the East Coast, so the Upper South, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, Delaware, a bit as well, right, uh, into the Deep South, into the cotton-producing regions, uh, Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama, uh, increasingly Texas as well, right? Uh, one of the interesting things and, and really one of the terrifying prospects to think about, uh, a lot of these people were moved over land, but a number were also transported over sea. Uh, and so you can imagine people being boarded into a ship in Norfolk, people who had heard stories from ancestors, from older folks about the Middle Passage, uh, and then being put into a ship uh, and not really knowing what was going to happen to them, right? Not knowing uh, what kind of experience they might have um, on that ship as it would sail likely into a place like New Orleans. So... Uh, slave traders, most of the people who were sold in the Second Middle Passage were sold from states like Maryland and Virginia. Slave traders would buy people and lead them on a trek or lead them on an ocean voyage um, with the goal of selling them to cotton planters. So the Second Middle Passage, I think, illuminates and allows us to see some of the human realities uh, of the growth of the system of slavery. So there's an institution that's growing and an institution that's expanding, but we have to think about uh, the marching of the people, right? The forced movement of individuals um, as slavery moved and expanded, right? The expansion of slavery was the movement uh, of people. So this was a, another kind of power that slave owners exercised as well, right? Uh, slave owners had the power to move people, to force them to do work in other places, So as cotton is changing the geography of the United States, it was also changing the nation's economy. Slave trading was part of this, right? Slave trading was a big business in the 19th century. Uh, there were slave trading firms in Baltimore and Richmond, and here you see one in Alexandria that's um, being sort of uh, inspected and photographed by Union troops during the Civil War. Um, slave trading firms in Baltimore and Richmond had connections with uh, slave traders in places like New Orleans and Mobile, Alabama. And so the South was being linked together by the business of, of trading slaves, of moving enslaved people. And the business of slave trading, uh, so this is an, an interior shot of this um, slave market, essentially a jail, right, where people would be held uh, waiting for sale in Alexandria. The business of slave trading was part of a larger set of economic relationships. And, and I just wanted to highlight here on this money from Alabama um, how important slavery and cotton production were uh, to the economy, right? Uh, enslaved people were literally on the money 
uh, in some parts of the South. So the business of slave trading became a part of a set of economic relationships that were bound to, that were connected to cotton production. Uh, and so this set of relationships reached far beyond the U.S. South. And an example of this is um, the Consolidated Association, Consolidated Association of Planners of Louisiana. The CAPL, as I will call it, because that is a mouthful. The CAPL was organized in 1827. And essentially it was a bank. It linked cotton planters, English investors, and the Louisiana government. So what we're seeing here is basically a sketch of how this organization worked. Investors in England bought bonds from the CAPO. The CAPO would loan money to slave owners in Louisiana. And slave owners would put up uh, land and enslave people as collateral, right? So if they failed, they might have to surrender a number of enslaved people to the bank. <coughs> slave owners would use the cash that they got from the CAPL to live their daily lives, right? Uh, they would uh, use it to buy land and slaves, to buy cotton seed, to buy a fancy velvet coat, if that's what they wanted to do, right? It was a bank. They could do whatever they wanted with this money. Repaying these loans, when slave owners repaid their loans, uh, that made dividends for English investors. And so basically you're getting uh, people connected across the Atlantic Ocean uh, and connected in the project of making profit off of enslaved people and the production of cotton. The most important development or innovation of the CAPL, though, is this, right? Louisiana tax revenue would protect investors in case of an emergency. If there was bad weather, if the price of cotton collapsed, if for some reason uh, a large collection of slave owners were unable to repay their loans, the CAPL got the government of Louisiana to back them. So if there was a crash, um, Louisiana tax dollars would be used to repay English investors. So this is like a, a state guarantee of uh, the risk of uh, investment in cotton. Governments uh, and investors on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean were getting deeply involved in the industry of cotton production. So the CAPL reflects it. It illustrates the extent of national and international investment uh, in American slavery. Cotton became the most important export product of the United States in the early 1800s. And slave owners were using financial power and they were using government, government power to enhance their wealth. So this is, I, I, I use the term national. Uh, it's also international, but I use the term national. And one of the interesting phenomenons phenomena connected to uh, the cotton industry are the ways that it brought together the North and the South. So cotton was the fuel for industry in the northern United States. New England factories produced large amounts of cotton clothing for American people, and a number of the American people for whom they produced cotton clothing were enslaved people. And so this photo is showing some of the clothing uh, that enslaved people might have been wearing. I think likely these clothes are made out of cotton, right? Uh, and there's this interesting phenomenon of uh, what's called Negro cloth. Uh, cotton was grown in the South, and then it was woven into a cheap and rough and, and ideally durable kind of fabric for clothing uh, that would then be sold back to slave owners in the South, right? So enslaved people were wearing the fruits of their labor, um, wearing this rough woven cotton clothing that's designed to sustain them as they work to cultivate more cotton. So this is part of the story of power in American slave societies. Slave owners had massive power on their plantations. They had extensive power beyond their plantations because they controlled so much wealth and because they had government support for their efforts to get rich by exploiting enslaved labor. 
So the institution of slavery is growing and it's moving and it's expanding and it's becoming increasingly embedded in the nation's economy. And I want to talk through now some of the ways that enslaved people would have experienced this as humans, right? Uh, what was it like to live through these changes? So in 1835, there was a family of North Carolina slave owners who decided to pack up uh, and move a number of their family members and uh, the people that they owned, a number of their enslaved people, to Alabama. So during the trip, uh, one of the women, one of the slave-owning women, who was named Sarah Sparkman, uh, asked the enslaved people that she owned, she asked them if they wanted to send messages back uh, to family, uh, messages back to their friends in North Carolina. Sparkman wrote uh, to describe what she was doing here. She said, the, she said, the servants request me to send many messages to all their friends and relations. I hope you will read it to their friends. They say it is the very words they want to say to them. So what you're looking at here is a message that a guy named Arthur Holly wanted to send to his wife, Amy, right? Um, and there are a couple of things that you can see here on a basic level, right? He's uh, letting her know that they're doing well. Uh, he's saying he's, he's glad to be able to have the chance to talk to her, um, to hear from her. He misses her, and he sends his love. We can imagine these are, you know, like regular things that uh, people would feel and, and convey to a family member from whom they were separated. There are a couple of things that I want to highlight here uh, as well. Um, so when you read this broadly, you can see how important family and friendship were to this one enslaved person, right? Uh, I hope to see you and the children in the spring, right? There is this desire, this need uh, to believe that in, in, the, in the near future, they will be reconnected. Arthur Holly had a wife, he had children, and he had friends back home, right? Uh, and I think this is key, right? I was might glad to hear from our home. Arthur Holly had a place that he identified as his home. And slave people made connections. Uh, they built communities. Uh, they established families. And so one of the obvious things you see here is that this family is fragile. Arthur Holly is being separated from his wife, right? His wife is being separated from her children. But these communities, these connections were no less valuable, no less significant to the people who made them because they were fragile. Um, it's just two parts of the reality uh, of what's happening here in slavery. Also, uh, Arthur Holly writes that he's sorry to hear that his master is sick. Um, so there are a couple ways we can interpret this, right? Uh, first, he might be saying that um, he might be saying this because he's dictating, he's reading these messages to Sarah Sparkman, right? And he knows that this slave owner would want to believe or want to imagine that Arthur Holly is actually concerned about slave owners' health, right? Uh, maybe he's saying this because he thinks that's what she wants to hear. Another way to read this is that Holly was actually concerned about his owner's health. A slave owner who was sick was a slave owner who might die. And when a slave owner died, enslaved people were often sold or inherited or given away. Uh, and they were given away in ways that split up the communities that enslaved people had built. So the health of a slave owner could be really, really important for someone like this writer. Uh, the health of, an, of a slave owner could be really important for the possibility that Arthur Holly might be able to stay in touch with his wife and friends in North Carolina. So thousands of people like this man were moved in pursuit of a cotton crop. The fact that people were treated as property had profound effects on their lives. And so I guess I'll just reiterate that since this is like the topic of your second essay, right? The fact that people were treated as property had profound effects on their lives. Historians estimate that the domestic slave trade broke up about one third of enslaved people's marriages in the Upper South. So again, the Upper South, North Carolina, Maryland, Virginia. It's likely that sale and forced movement separated about half of all enslaved children from at least one of their parents. So the economy of slavery had uh, dangerous results for black families, for black communities. As all of this proceeded, enslaved people organized and they strategized 
and they looked for ways that they might claim some kind of power over their lives. So their connections to one another were critical for the kinds of power they were able to use. And one way we can understand the importance of these kinds of connections is through the practice of truancy. So truancy describes the practice of enslaved people running away from a plantation, running away from a farm, and staying away for a few nights. Maybe they would stay away for a week or two. But the distinction between truancy and just running away, or I shouldn't say just running away, the distinction between truancy and running away is that enslaved people who were described as truant were not necessarily intending to leave the South. So there's a woman named Sally Smith who describes some of her experiences with this. Smith was interviewed in the late 1800s, uh, after the end of slavery, after having survived emancipation. Um, And Smith talked to an interviewer about her life in Louisiana as a slave. Smith said that uh, at one point she had a quota. She had to pick 150 pounds of cotton each day. And that if she didn't meet that quota, she would be whipped. So one night... Sally Smith decided that she was going to try to avoid the hassle, right? Avoid the possible punishment, avoid the hardship of labor, of picking cotton. Uh, And so Sally Smith went and hid in the woods. Uh, She described basically like this perpetual practice that developed after she went away the first time. Uh, Smith said, sometimes I'd go so far off from the plantation, I could not hear the cows low or the roosters crow. So Sally Smith is, like, really getting away. She is uh, out. She is not in a space where the plantation is really nearby. And so Smith would hide out for as long as she could, but sometimes she had to come back when she needed food. And so she, she talked about this one night, right? Uh, she went back to the quarter. She went back to the place where enslaved people lived. She knocked on a lady's door uh, and asked for some food. The lady says, I ain't got a piece of bread done, but if you want, you can bake you a corn cake. And so Sally Smith is starting to feed herself, and just as she's about to make her meal, the overseer comes in and catches her. So there are a couple of important things you can see about truancy in this piece of Smith's interview, right? Uh, One of them is that truancy was fostered by African-American communities. Smith was trying to use her connections to other enslaved people to help her stay away from forced labor, right? She is literally not away from the plantation, but she is avoiding the work of picking cotton, right? She comes back to the plantation to try to get food. And I think it's, it's important that Sally Smith asks for help, and this woman says, you know, I don't have exactly what you want, but here is how I can help you, right? You can bake a corn cake. Uh, This woman is trying to offer help in whatever way she can. So truancy was possible because of African-American communities. Connections between people, connections among enslaved people, made it possible for individuals like Sally Smith to escape their owner's grasp for a few nights or for a few weeks at a time. So Smith ran away, but, of course, in, in this moment, she didn't really get away. Uh, in this case, she got caught. And every time Smith ran away, she was punished. And the punishment was a particularly horrific experience. So the overseer here catches Sally Smith, uh, and then Smith, uh, sorry, Smith can tell that he's upset, right? The overseer had a big barrel he kept to roll us in. So the overseer has a barrel, and what he does, as Smith describes it, is take a bucket of nails and hammer those nails in from the, uh, sorry, uh, out, from the inside of the barrel to the out, right? So the nail heads are all uh, wrapped around inside of this barrel. Uh, And then he puts Sally Smith in the barrel and rolls her around. Essentially, Sally Smith was beaten up by a barrel full of nail heads. Another interesting piece of this, of course, though, is that Once she is out, right, she's sore, she's bruised all over, 
And there's another nice old lady that looks out for her, right? A poor old woman uh, greased her all over uh, and helped her get over her bruises, right? So that she would be able to go back to work as she was required. So again, you can see community dimensions of what's happening here. Uh, but it's, it's important to recognize that this punishment was a horrific experience, right? And so I wanted to talk about this particular punishment because I think truancy can feel like a really odd act, right? Like, why go away if you're not going to get away, right? Uh, what does it actually matter if Sally Smith leaves the plantation, but then she gets caught and she gets punished in this horrific way, right? So truancy can feel like a thing that's, like, not all that meaningful uh, if we start thinking about it in those terms. Uh, so the interviewer is maybe thinking about this as well, right? Uh, after Sally Smith tells the interviewer, Octavia Rogers, about this punishment, Rogers asks, uh, I suppose that was an end to your stays in the woods, but Sally Smith says, no, I did not stay more than a month before I ran away again. I tell you, I could not stay there. So there were some important reasons why enslaved people went truant, right? Sally Smith dealt with this brutal punishment and then decided that again and again she would continue to try to leave. People like Sally Smith, so one of the reasons why people might pursue truancy as a strategy. People might not have thought they would be able to run to freedom in some other place. So one way to think about this is geography. Sally Smith is in Louisiana, right? If she wants to get to Pennsylvania, right, or New York, where abolition laws are taking effect, right, that's a really long way to go. She has to run through a lot of slavery to find uh, a potential life in freedom, right? If Sally Smith stayed close to the plantation like she did in this case, if she stayed close, she could come back to borrow food. Uh, she could come back and, and try to get things from neighbors. But if she left, if she ran through Alabama and Mississippi and tried to find her way to the north, she lost that potential support system. So one of the reasons truancy happened, uh, and we'll talk more about this in the weeks to come, one of the reasons truancy, truancy happened is because running away from a from a plantation, escaping slavery was incredibly difficult. Also, another way to think about how truancy happened uh, is that enslaved people understood that running away from a plantation often meant leaving behind family and friends. So as much as enslaved people hated their bondage, they weren't always ready to abandon the place that they might have seen as home. So think back to Arthur Holly, right? Uh, he is, he seems to be sad to be leaving the place that he feels is his home in North Carolina. And part of that is because he's leaving his wife. Part of that might be because he's leaving his friends, right? Part of that is just because he's got a familiar place. Even if that familiar place is a plantation where he's held as a slave, right? It is the place that he knows, uh, and so running away from slavery was a decision that would separate enslaved people from a lot of what they understood, a lot of what they knew, uh, and a lot of what they appreciated about their lives, right? The family, friends, community. But I also want to encourage you guys to think about truancy as an act as a phenomenon that was really tremendously meaningful, both to enslaved people and slave owners. So there are important differences between truancy and escape, right? Truancy and flight. But for enslaved people, truancy could feel liberating. So think about the, the way that we talked about the possibilities for freedoms in slavery for Gabriel, right? Um, Sally Smith, Sally Smith is experiencing similar kinds of like moments or flashes of freedom. Smith got punished when she got caught, but while she was in the woods, she spent a few days not picking cotton, not having her pickings weighed, not being whipped, not being watched over very carefully to see whether she was actually doing the work that she was being compelled to do, right? So Sally Smith got a few days off of work on the most basic level. Sally Smith also 
spent a few days living for herself, right? And she, she writes about, or uh, she talks in this interview about, uh, like, bugs and snakes and all kinds of, like, scary outdoor stuff that she's dealing with, right? She's sleeping in the woods. She's not camping. But even with all that, she's saying that this is uh, something that she came to enjoy, right? She came to appreciate the time she spent out in the woods on her own. Uh, she was living outside of the oversight and the violence of her plantation. So truancy, on one level, is important because it helps us to see some of the strategies enslaved people use to claim some power over their own lives. Sally Smith went to the woods because it made her feel good. Truancy also points to how powerful enslaved people's actions could be in relation to the larger system of slavery. So let's think about this. In the eyes of slave owners, we might think about slavery as, let's make sure this is nice and solid. In the eyes of slave owners, slavery was like a fence. It was a bound space, right? And the idea for slave owners was that they could put a person in this space and compel them to do particular things, right? You will go to this place and do this particular work for this long, right? Six days a week uh, at more intensity at particular times of year, right? The idea of slave owners, slave owners' idea of slavery was that it was a fence that dictated where and how enslaved people uh, lived their lives. Every time an enslaved person did something they weren't supposed to do, every time an enslaved person went somewhere they won't, weren't supposed to be, they poked a little hole in that fence. So when Sally Smith runs to the woods, she's poking a hole. When she's punished and then runs again, maybe she's poking an even bigger hole, right? Acts like truancy challenge the idea that slave owners had absolute control over slaves. Again, what's important here is that this is slave owners' idea of slavery, right? Let me just... Um, <coughs> This is how people who owned slaves wanted to imagine slavery, right, as a solid fence. And the reality was that it was poked through, shot through with holes, right, uh, that enslaved people used to uh, live lives in the ways that they wanted to. So Sally Smith's truancy was a threat to her owner's belief that he controlled the people he owned. And there were all sorts of ways that enslaved people could seek power in their lives. Sometimes they would break tools. Sometimes they would destroy crops, right? Sometimes they would just work a little slower, right? Uh, they might take breaks. They might um, plot, right? Sometimes people like Nat Turner would uh, rise up. We'll talk about him in the weeks to come. Sometimes Gabriel would plot a conspiracy. Sometimes a group of enslaved people in a place like South Carolina would come together share particular cultural practices and try to escape to freedom in Florida, right? Every day, enslaved people did things that were different from what their owners wanted them to do. One of the most frequent things that they could try to do was, one of the most frequent things that they did was try to control the pace of their work. Uh, and so some of the songs that enslaved people might sing could be used to try to regulate or uh, influence the pace of labor on a plantation. So I want to play a little piece of one of these songs, the song Ho Emma Ho, that'll uh, allow us to think about this a little bit. Ho Emma Ho You turn around, dig a hole in the ground Ho Emma Ho Ho Emma Ho you turn around, dig a hole in the ground. Oh. 
appreciates music generally, right, can understand that songs that might be intended for one place can be enjoyed in other places, right? This is a song that historians understand as a work song. And that's how you're hearing it sung there. And the lyrics are suggesting, like, this is the work we're doing. We're just going to sing about it and maybe enjoy that, right? But the song doesn't have to be confined to the cotton fields. We can imagine that a song like this might be sung uh, at home. It might be sung at a party, and it might be fast. It might be like, ho, Emma, ho. Like, it could sound totally different than it sounded there, right? Or we can imagine that it's August 28th, right? It's really hot. It's Alabama. It's miserable out there. And people are out in the field working, and they're trying to make sure that nobody makes anybody else look too bad. And so they might sing, ho, Emma, ho. And so we can see with this song, we can think about uh, another ways that we can understand, another way that we can understand the connections between like labor and politics and African American communities. So the song is important, Ho Emma Ho, it's important because it's a cultural development that was shaped by the work of slavery. It was also a cultural development that allowed enslaved people to try to shape the work they were doing. So the song was a way they tried to shape some of the terms of their labor. And this is just one example of one of the tools that enslaved people might use in pursuit of some control over their lives. So the institution of slavery was a constant struggle between slave owners trying to extract as much labor as possible from enslaved people and enslaved people looking for and finding ways, individually and collectively, ways that they could control their own lives. So if we look back at Solomon Northup's writing, we can see this struggle play out, right? Uh, the lash is flying from morning to night the whole day long. The prevalence of whipping was a response to enslaved people seeking power over their own lives. Slave owners and overseers used the whip because they understood that they needed to force enslaved people to do the things that they wanted them to do. So before we wrap up, I want to talk about one more piece of Solomon Northup's narrative. Um, after he describes the violence of the plantation and writes about the hardship of being forced to learn how to pick cotton, Northup leaves readers with what I think is a, is a really stunning observation. Northup writes, there are few sights more pleasant to the eye than a wide cotton field when it is in the bloom. It presents an appearance of purity, like an immaculate expanse of light, uh, excuse me, like an immaculate expanse of light, new fallen snow. So it's compelling to me that Solomon Northup could reflect on the beauty of this landscape at the same time that he's thinking about uh, the horrific circumstances that shaped it, right? The cotton crop that Solomon Northup describes as beautiful was violently extracted from enslaved people forced to work. So what Northup suggests here is that it's critical to think about the conditions that produced cotton and the crop that it became, right? To think about both the horror and uh, the beauty that are embodied on a plantation, right? Uh, in the same way, I think it's important to think in complex terms about um, the wealth and the power of the United States in relation to um, the institution of slavery. The U.S. became a wealthy nation uh, and a global economic power in large part because of brutal violence perpetrated against people like this, used to force enslaved people to produce cotton. So the labor of producing cotton and the violence that was used to extract that labor never made enslaved people anything less than human. Even as people were treated as property, bought and sold and moved as though they had no wills, they were always negotiating, they were always struggling for control over their lives, uh, even as slave owners tried to use them uh, as tools to generate wealth for themselves, right? So I want to wrap up there and I want to turn to
uh, our big questions and make sure that we're all on the same page, right? So broadly, a couple of things that we want to think through here that we've thought through today. How did labor shape the lives of enslaved people in the U.S. South? Uh, and what can we understand or how can we understand the power struggles between enslaved people and slave owners? What were some of the tools uh, that were used in these struggles? So what do we know? Yeah. Uh, with the growth of cotton in the Deep South especially, we saw a lot of families get broken up. Like you, you said that I think like one-third of marriages were... Mm broken up and uh obviously that could be pretty traumatizing for a family and especially with uh, the kids that were separated from their families so a lot of just uh i guess tough times for people in that in the when the growth of cotton yeah so the the demands of slave owners and the power of slave owners to move people around um broke families Broke communities, right, uh, among enslaved people. Other thoughts here? What do we know? Uh, yeah. So labor, in a sense, like, developed communities and culture for them to be able to, like, um, I guess not only cope with, but, like, create some, like, sort of power about how they saw themselves um, in relation to their environment and, like, each other. Yeah, so I, I like this, right? Like, uh, community is really critical for enslaved people, but it's not just a way for people to cope, right? It's not just a way for people to um, deal with slavery, but to strategize, to develop tools and tactics to run away for a little while, right? Uh, that would enable them to feel uh, some kind of power over their lives. Other thoughts on power here and, and its manifestations? What are some of the things that slave owners did that empowered them? What were some of the things that slave owners did that empowered them? John, yeah. Uh, you mentioned how they like carry a whip, and also they would punish uh, <coughs> slaves that would uh, go out of hand or try to like run away. Not only to punish them so they wouldn't do it again, but also to like show an example to the other slaves so they would uh, be less likely to do what they did. Yeah, so violence is, is critical here, right? Violence was uh, the means of, in some ways, trying to repair this fence that was being broken and punctured uh, by enslaved people, right? And, and also, of course, the, the tools of wealth, the tools of political power. Um, in some ways, we'll see when we start talking about fugitive slaves, the tools of the law, the ways that slave owners deployed the state as a way to try to uh, enhance their strength and secure their title to their human property. So broadly, what you guys have gotten at here is the reality that, again, to reiterate, slavery was a constant struggle between slave owners and enslaved people. Slave owners and enslaved people struggled, they wrestled uh, every day over control of an enslaved person's body uh, and control over an enslaved person's time. And we'll see uh, in the weeks to come uh, some of how that struggle developed and some of the other tools and techniques and really some, uh, some more interesting and vivid stories about um, how that struggle played out. Cool? All right, so uh, that's what I have for today. I will see you guys next week. Thanks for listening. Please rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. And we want to hear from you. You can email us at podcasts at c-span.org.